Good morning, brothers and sisters. And again, happy Sabbath. Before we return into our study of the book of Joel, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance, ask him for his blessings, thank him for his watch care, and request his wisdom so that we may more clearly understand that which we need to see at this time in earth's history. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day, for this rest, for the events of the week that are now past, and for all of the light that you are showing upon our path. Father, we have great need of you. This world is ending, and as we can see, there are many signs that are showing just how quickly your spirit is being withdrawn from this world. Help us now, Father, as we open your word. May our minds be open to receive that which you would have us to receive. Guide us now, Father. Direct us, each one. We have great need of you. We can see that we have needed the blessings that you have provided through this week, and for these we thank you. Help us now. Direct us in all things. May your will be done. May your angels attend us. May your spirit continue to show us that which we need in our lives so that we may draw closer to you. Be with us now, each one, as we assemble. We thank you for this. For as we understand, where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We invite you into this meeting to direct us, to show us that that we need. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, in the name of Jesus, amen. Now, before us we have the book of Joel that we began studying this last week. Now, before we return into this portion of Joel, there was a reference that was given, I believe it was by Sister Dana last week, that I believe we need to address. And we need to consider the words, the admonition, and the symbols. So now, before you is a document from Review and Herald. And as we begin to look at this, is there any symbol that stands out before we begin directly addressing this article? Well, uh, the most obvious thing is the date at the top. Uh, right. 225. And 1902. Yes, yeah, so 252. Hello. Yeah. So here again, we have what some would call a fractal, what some could call a tithe, but is definitely a symbol of the 2520. That's one that I have in my notes. Okay. The first paragraph here. Nevertheless, 
I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the, the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, what church is being referenced here? Well, the most obvious is the SDA. No, <laughs> the, well, uh, I mean, Phil, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about uh, the seven churches. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't remember which number, but I, I know what the reference, what you're talking about. So Ephesus ain't it? Is Ephesus? I might have said it wrong. Brother it William. Ephesus. Is it if? I, I believe you are correct, Brother William, that it's Ephesus. Yeah, Ephesus. that's right. Which of the churches is the church of Ephesus? It's the first church, and it's the it's the one that um, started with Christ. So we need to pay attention to this, don't we? Let's say so. Okay. You better be paying attention to everything. Well, especially this that we're we're finding here in the Book of Revelation, because this second paragraph. I am instructed to say these words are applicable to Seventh-day Adventist churches in their present condition. What was the first love of the Seventh-day Adventist church? What was the love of the Millerites? All the truth. Understanding of scripture, prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. The love of God has been lost, and this means the absence of love for one another. Self, self, self is cherished and is striving for supremacy. For supremacy. How long is this to continue? Unless there is a reconversion. There will soon be such a lack of godliness that the church will be represented by the barren fig tree. Great light has been given to her. She has had abundant opportunity for bearing much fruit. But selfishness has come in and God says, I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Is this the message that the church wants to hear at this time? Is this the message that the movement wants to hear at this time? It doesn't appear that way. Jesus looked upon the pretentious, fruitless fig tree and with mournful reluctance pronounced the words of doom. And under the curse of an offended God, the fig tree withered away. God help his people to make an application of this lesson while there is still time. Now, this lesson is found twice in the Gospels. We have Matthew 21, 18 to 22, a total of five verses. And we have Mark 11, 12 to 14, a total of three verses. Yet there's something different about both of them. Has anybody ever considered the differences in these two examples? So, um, your question again, please. Uh, got a 
a slight distraction from my growth on my shoulder. Certainly. We have these examples shown to us twice. Yet these examples have a difference. Has anyone ever considered the difference between the example from Matthew and the example from Mark? Is this a trick question? No. No, I don't. I don't recall if we if we made this comparison. Okay. Now, if we were to open Matthew twenty-one, starting in verse eighteen, this book states now in the morning as he returned into the city he hungered so we would verse, be looking at verse, excuse me, verse matthew 21 18 18 okay thank you now the verse states as he returned into the city. As he returned to Jerusalem. Now. It's interesting because the prior verse 21 17. States and he left them and went out of the city into Bethany. And he lodged there. Well, Matthew, well, Mark, well, Mark 12, I mean, Mark 11, 12 says that this Beth, Bethany. Correct. Hungered. Quite correct. Now, what's interesting to me further, when I look at Matthew 21, 12, which precedes 2118. We read this. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. As yes. it is, the as point, it is. of course, 21, 12 is 21 times 12 is 252. And so that's exactly. Now, two things are being pointed out in the chat. With the fig tree, Christ is inspecting his professed people as in the investigative judgment. Amen. And then, as Brother Aran has pointed out, Matthew 21, 18 and Mark eleven twelve 12 are connected. Now, is this a, a, a multiple, this is a multiplication of some type? One being 808, a verse count. Okay, so we have a verse count. Here is Matthew 21, 18, 808 verse. And Mark eleven twelve 12 shows as negative 808. So it's the distance between the verses. When we look at this, why is the number eight important? Was Christ not raised on the eighth yeah. day? I'm sorry, it took me a while to get to my, but yes, that's what I was talking about. Okay. Now, when we look at Matt, 
Mark eleven twelve. <coughs> Excuse me. Here. As we, as we consider this, it says, And on the morrow, when they were coming to Bethany, he was hungry. Matthew states that he was looking to return to the city. Mark, that when they were come from Bethany, that he was hungry. But the verses preceding this in Mark deal with the triumphal entry. It is after the situation with the fig tree that Mark records the cleansing of the temple. According to Sister White, I believe we would see that Mark would be more correct than Matthew as far as its chronology. Here we have a lesson. Christ inspects. He looks to see is there fruit on the tree of my people before he executes a judgment and is pointed out again in the chat Bethany Beth meaning house of so we have the house of figs where one would expect to be fed how many times brothers and sisters have we gone to churches, to meetings, expecting to be fed, expecting to be fed the meat of the word and received less than milk? Is it not the point that we are given right now within this movement that we are to assist others to understand that they have been being given milk or less than milk when it has been the meat that they have needed to be able to grow as people faithful and honoring Christ. So I'd just like to point out, uh, Bethany is also the location where Lazarus was, where Magdalene was, Martha, that's where the family was, and that's also where Simon and um, uh, Judas lived. Right. So all of this, the one house where Jesus could rest was in Bethany, in the house of figs. Just before his ascension, Christ said to his disciples, All power is given to me, unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. God's people today are not fulfilling this commission as they should. Selfishness present, prevents them from receiving these words in their solemn significance. <clears throat> Again, from the chat, we are shown that the woke church the woke elders and the woke congregants want an LGBT plus friendly Bible. 
Is there a greater example for us of a barren fig tree than this? John the Baptist made it very clear. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Are we to be any less direct than John the Baptist? In many hearts, there seem to be scarcely a breath of spiritual life. This makes me very sad. I fear that aggressive warfare against the world, the flesh, and the devil has not been maintained. Shall we cheer on by half dead Christianity, the selfish, covetous spirit of the world, sharing its ungodliness and smiling on its falsehood? Nay, by the grace of God, let us be steadfast to the principles of truth, holding firm to the end of the beginning of our confidence. We are to be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. One is our master, even Christ. To him we are to look. From him we are to receive our wisdom. By his grace we are to preserve our integrity, standing before God in meekness and contrition, and representing him to the world. Sermons have been in great demand in our churches. The members have depended upon pulpit declamations instead of upon the Holy Spirit. Are we to depend upon the words presented by men for our spiritual food, or are we to depend upon the Holy Spirit? Uncalled for and unused, the spiritual gifts bestowed upon them have dwindled into feebleness. If the ministers would go forth into new fields, the members would be obliged to bear responsibilities and by use their capabilities would increase. Now, where are we to be? Are we bearing responsibilities? And is the church seeing benefit from this? Is the movement seeing benefit from this? Or are we shirking our responsibilities? God brings against ministers and people the heavy charge of spiritual feebleness saying, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, thou, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the, at the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So what church is being referred to here? Which of the seven Lord, churches? Lord, here is the seventh church. And what do we call the seventh church, brother? Seven day Adventists. What is the name of Laodicean? The Laodicean. I Laodicea. To what is God calling Laodicea? As Mrs. White continues here in the seventh paragraph, God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until he will refuse to acknowledge them as his children. 
is it the goal of the church today to be abhorred of Christ? Is it the goal of the church today to be cast out or to have it stated that like this pretentious fig tree, we have many leaves, but we have no fruit? No. Under whose guidance is this revival and reformation to take place? Well, it's, it's no human. <laughs> As it says in this paragraph, a revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. It is the job which comes from where? Which comes from God alone. Thank you. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. It is the need of man for a revival and re formation under the guidance of the ministration of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of the spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and the heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, in habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must blend. Sorry, they didn't hear that very last word. They must what? They must blend. Mm, blend they must egg. be combined. Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. <clears throat> Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christ gave his life for a fallen race, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. To him who does this will be spoken the words of approval. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Three of the Gospels record this parable. Three times this admonition is given. The word of the Lord never represses activity. It increases man's usefulness by guiding his activities in the right direction. The Lord does not leave man without an objective pursuit. He places before him an immortal inheritance and gives him ennobling truth that he may advance in a safe and sure path in pursuit of that which is worth the consecration of his highest capabilities, a crown of everlasting life. Man will increase in power as he follows on to know the Lord. That tells me that our spiritual muscle, our spiritual strength, will increase the more we follow to know the Lord. 
As he endeavors to reach the highest standard, the Bible is as a light to guide his footsteps homeward. In that word, he finds that he is a joint heir with Christ to an eternal treasure. The guidebook points him in the unsearchable riches of heaven. By following on to know the Lord, he is securing never-ending happiness. Day by day, the peace of God is his reward. And by faith, he sees a home of everlasting sunshine, free from all sorrows and disappointment. God directs his footsteps and keeps him from falling. God loves his church. There are tares that are mingled with the wheat, but the Lord knows his own. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, that have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, <clears throat> but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, here we are. In this short article, Mrs. White has now given reference to three of the seven churches of Revelation. What churches has she referred to? in number when we looked at this at the very beginning which church had left their first love Ephesus was one Ephesus is the is one yes but more directly Ephesus was the first church correct right so here we have Ephesus being referenced, the first church. When we come down a little further, we have the warning that is given here against the ministers and the people, the heavy charge of spiritual feebleness. And which is the most feeble of the seven churches? Is this not the seventh church, the church that we know as Laodicea? Uh, yes, as you question, as your question was, uh, who is the weakest, basically? Right. If I paraphrase it. Yeah, that would be us. Okay. But what church has the greatest light? Laodicea. Uh, that would be us. Yes. Amen. Now, here, she has given reference to Sardis. What church is Sardis? Is this not the fifth church? Okay, as it's pointed out in the chat, yes, this is the fifth church. So, we have the first church, first love, that which we should have for what Christ has done for us. We have the fifth church. The fifth being the number of the wise and the foolish virgins. That waiting Sardis, for right? that Sardis, right? Yeah, that's right before the Philadelphia church, too, by the way. I see where you're going with this. Okay. But it's the fifth church <clears throat> that is giving us the signification of the wise virgins. Mm -hmm. 
And then we have the seventh church, the one with the most light, the one that is the weakest, the one that has the greatest need for complete and total reliance upon the word of God. Shall not the counsel of Christ have an effect on the churches? Why halt ye who know the truth between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Here we have the lesson again of Elijah. And the lesson that was pressed upon Ahab. Can we afford to halt between two opinions? That would be no. The next two sentences are damning. Christ's followers have no right to stand on the ground of neutrality. There is more hope of an open enemy than of one who is neutral. We cannot afford to be neutral at this time. We have no right to attempt to stand in neutrality. Either we are accepting that which Christ has presented or we are taking the position of the adversary. There is no middle ground. <clears throat> Let the church respond to the words of the prophet. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. God's people have lost their first love. They must now repent and make steady advancement in the path of holiness. God's purposes reach to every phase of life. They are immutable. They are eternal. And at the time appointed, they will be executed. For a time, it may seem that Satan has all the power in his hands, but our trust is in God. When we draw near to him, he will draw near to us and will work with mighty power to accomplish his gracious purposes. Our trust is to be in Jehovah. God rebukes his people for their sins that he may humble them and lead them to seek his face. As they reform and his love revives in their heart, his loving answers will come to their requests. He will strengthen them in reformatory action, lifting up for them a standard against the enemy. His rich blessing will rest upon them and in bright rays, they will reflect the light of heaven. There is a multitude not of their faith, seeing that God is with his people. will unite with them in serving the Redeemer. How many times do we have to be reminded that Christ stated, many sheep of other folds have I. Now the question that's being asked in the chat. How does someone stand on the ground of neutrality? When we have, when we have statements such as. We will see what happens. When we have statements and actions that, well, we really don't want to have to hear what someone else has to say, 
because what they're saying is too harsh. Because they're not accepting of another's opinion. Then we are standing on this ground of, of neutrality. Does anyone remember Sister White's wording for being assisted by military? Um, I'm not recalling that. And I'm also hearing me. I apologize. That was a broadcast message for the whole group. If you have some knowledge of it, would you please uh, forward it to me? I'll put my email address in the chat. Okay. We cannot afford to stand neutral at this time. We cannot afford to, like the world, and also profess to love Christ. We are being told here directly that God's people have lost their first love. We need to rekindle that first love so that we will be more like Ephesus and less like Laodicea. So the quote that was used last Sabbath has now been addressed in this entire article. I found it to be an article that we need very much to consider carefully. Have you broadcast out your notes? Yes. Now, we got through four verses in the book of Joel last week. We addressed <clears throat> very specifically that the book of Joel led to a division within this movement. As was being presented, Elder Jeff was very willing to listen to the points and the thoughts of others in reference to this, even though he found their reasoning to be faulty. Yet, the others gave no credence with Elder Jeff and chose not to listen to anything that he had said further on this point in these verses because they believed that their knowledge was superior to that of, Mil of Miller's rules <clears throat> that Elder Jeff had been using. When we see this, that Joel de Joel declares the destruction of the fruits of the earth by noxious insects. We are finding that these insects, step by step, when we use Miller's rules, <clears throat> we should see that these are representative of the beast. that is seeking the destruction of this message. The word of the Lord <clears throat> that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, 
Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Are we seeing this today? Have we seen this in the past? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That the residue of the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. I agree, neutrality is not supporting or helping either side in a conflict. Yet, here, we are told, awake, ye drunkards. And weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine. Who is being referred to here as a drunkard? Who is being referred Ephraim. to? Excuse? Wasn't it Ephraim? Well, there's Ephraim. But what, what's being represented by the drinkers of wine? Um, the follow, not, the, not following the doctrine, um, the hierarchy, the uh, people that um, are supposed to be giving us the, the right stuff. When we're drinking the wine, are we to drink the new wine or are we to drink of the wine of Babylon? Well, the fresh stuff that Jesus created. Do we not also see that wine being exemplified throughout the word of God? Uh, absolutely. So these drunkards are being told, weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine. Because here is what Christ has created. Where do we find Christ and wine first within the Gospels? The marriage, when he went to the marriage, he made wine and new wine. What's important about the symbol of the marriage? Uh, the garments, the wedding garments, um, adopting Christ's character. Uh, I, I don't know what you're asking. What's taking place at a, at a marriage? Oh, a marriage, for one thing. And then afterwards, a reception usually, or something in that nature. That's what we do. Uh, uh, are you talking about back in the past? Like that? It's, it's Christ coming. I'm sorry. Go it's ahead. Christ coming, right? It's a covenant. Thank oh, you. Oh, there you have it. Here is Christ. <clears throat> he is seeking to enter into a covenant. He is seeking to enter into a covenant with his church. But his church is more enamored with that which is presented by those that don't want the covenant. Because the covenant means that they are accepting of Christ's rulership Joel 1 6 for a nation is come upon my land strong and without number whose teeth 
are as the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. The symbol of the lion was the symbol of what nation in the Bible? Babylon. Yes. Note, please. For a nation is come upon my land. Whose land is this? George. Is this not Christ's land? Yeah. So we have we have an intruder. This intruder. He hath lain my vine waste. He hath laid my fig tree for a barking. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. If the vine is made waste, if the fig tree has now been barked, if the fig tree has been cast away, then the food has been sent away as well. I know this might be a... Um... Silly question, but I'm gonna ask you. The bark, the bark, would it be like because it's a covering for the tree, right? Wouldn't it Correct. be like a wouldn't it be like a covenant of righteousness? That could be. Anyone else have an idea on that? Anyone else have an idea? We know that if the vine is laid waste, that there is no further wine. If it is laid waste, then we are dependent upon others for our doctrine. If the fig tree is barked, the tree then is destroyed. If the branches are made white, they are very much like bones. And of course, in life, do we see the bones of others? I believe we only see the bones at death. What nation is this that does it, that creates this destruction? Upon God's people. Is Islam creating this kind of destruction upon God's people? No. Yes, maybe. I mean, depends on how you look at it. But I, I would think Rome would be the most biggest culprit. Well... Well, if we go in, uh, we going in and 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 um, it said you. Where am I? Well, wouldn't we just talking about Babylon? If this is going in in um, order, wouldn't it be Babylon that make does this does this to the people? Does this to um. Right. Now, who represents Babylon today? Well, if um, that would be the um, the um, papacy. Thank you. The point being, Rome establishes the vision. Right. Yes. As Mrs. What, what, I, I just, what is Islam? Where is Islam in that verse? I don't see Islam in this verse. 
think that was your point, wasn't it? Yes. It oh, is. okay. Okay. I, I misunderstood. It. I'm sorry. No, no. Don't be sorry. Okay. There's That's what we're always, all here for. Th that we're all here to consider carefully the words that are written within Scripture. Yeah, it, it's it's not an individual. It's a movement. All right, thank you. Couldn't add up for me. Thank you. you we need individually to understand our duties and our privileges. We need to understand this individually so that we may, as a group, come together. Did Simon Peter, Cephas, have much to do with Simon the Zealot before they came as disciples to Christ? Did John, the beloved, have interaction on an ongoing basis with Matthew, the publican, the tax collector? I don't think there's any witness to that. We've seen the, the two, the brothers and um, Peter coming from the same village, right? They were all fishermen, correct? Right. But I don't, I didn't, I don't see uh, this. I don't see any evidence that the guy was, I mean, I don't remember any evidence. I won't say I didn't see it. <laughs> I see a lot of things. I have a problem with my memory. That's why I record stuff. The point here is that <clears throat> these men were brought together because each of them had a desire to come to understand the message that Christ was presenting. Amen. They were all different in temperament, training, and backgrounds. Amen. Within the movement right now, we need all different training, temperament, and backgrounds so that we may be able, as a group, to understand our responsibilities of that which we are to do at this time. Therefore, again, we need individually to understand our duties and our privileges. The things suffered and enjoyed are full of meaning. And if we take heed to God's holy precepts, we shall prove in our character that we have known the things that make for our peace. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 130. This expression, simple, does not mean those deficient in intellect but those who have the simplicity of a child willing to learn of its parents, teachable and obedient. They will discern the requisitions of divine truth and their prayer will be, O Lord, do thou teach us how to learn of thee, that we may be wise in thy wisdom and happy in doing thy will in obedience and love. Here, we need to see that within this movement that we are all here to learn one is not greater than another. The moment that we have others that believe themselves to be greater than anyone else within the movement is a warning sign for us. Amen. For those are choosing not to be instructed, for they are unwilling to be childlike. <clears throat> the end of all things is at hand, and iniquity abounds. <clears throat> because men have transgressed the law and broken the everlasting covenant, 
given on condition of obedience and because of continual transgression. We have a collection of verses that are presented before us. All of these chapters we have entered into and we have studied. We are now at the last of the chapters of this list. But as it is stating that the end of all things is at hand, because men have transgressed the law and have broken the everlasting covenant given on condition of obedience. Let's remember that this covenant is very important for us. <clears throat> there we have the prophecies of the state of our world just prior to the second coming of the Lord thy God. The world will become more and more under the sway of seducing spirits as they turn away from God and his righteous government. <clears throat> Men professing godliness will indulge their own traits of character unless they are conscientiously under the control of God. They will become self-indulgent and self-centered. When we are unwilling to allow others to speak, we are self-centered. When we are unwilling to allow others to ask questions, we are self-indulgent. Whose ground are we walking on if we are in that kind of a condition? Well, the enemies. Repeat, please. If, if, if we'd be walking on the enemies if we didn't follow it. Exactly. The next section of this chapter. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord ministers, mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is ashamed, the oil languisheth. Why is the new wine ashamed? Or as it also states, the new wine is dried up. Are we so dependent upon the teachings and the thoughts of Parminder and Tess? that we are willing to allow the doctrine of God to be dried up? Are we desiring that that new wine should be ashamed? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I don't get that impression from this group. I understand. But what do we see within the rest of the movement and here well, again, I, 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 I see a lot of things um, that aren't necessarily conducive to truth right here again when I'm pointing one finger I have three pointed back at me amen brother so anytime that I'm noting a deficiency elsewhere, I had better look for at least a threefold deficiency within my own character. Now the translators of the Bible were talking about this section of Joel. As we go back to the very front. So... Um, uh, I, I've been 
in the military. I've studied military um, procedures pretty much uh, for a very long time. And sure. um, for your analogy, I would like to uh, offer you this, that as uh, a ranger and you are in the forward position, um, you oftentimes allow people to pass you and you use your whole hand spread out with your all of your fingers pointing in the direction you're to travel. And by the way, the thumb is pointing up when you do this. Right. So we're not to criticize. We're just to point directions. How is it said in scripture? Are we not to be as fearful as an army with banners? <laughs> Which is the um, title of the group that I was picked at, kicked out of. Uh, right. Last Sabbath. Well, the following day in the morning at about two in the morning. Okay. Yeah. I chose not to follow that. Group. Or, well, they kicked me out. They, <laughs> they didn't like where I was pointing. What was Ellen White's maiden name? Gold. No. Oh, oh, Harmon. Harmon. And what is the meaning of Harmon? Uh, help me. Army man. <laughs> you like that it one? It keeps better and better, bro. It just keeps getting better and better. You've been following my thread, right? Oh, I've followed it quite closely. Now, from the chat, an excellent point is being made. Barked is Hebrew 7111. <laughs> That's an interesting number. Isn't it? But now, first... Joel is declaring the destruction of the fruits by noxious insects and is declaring the destruction of these fruits by a long drought. So when we're looking at this in Joel... So seven. Yes. One, one, one. It was seven and three ones, right? Correct. Okay. Am I seeing something here? Uh, seven. Followed okay. by three or seven plus three is ten. Right. So mm. so this is um, uh, in the story of Joseph, you have 11 years and 17 years or 17 years and 11 years. And 17 times 11 is 187. But also, if you take uh, 71 times 11, you get 781. Any any or most numbers, if you multiply them by 11, they'll just become reversed. Um, if you understand what I'm saying, if you reverse, um, you take the reverse number, multiply it by 11. Anyway, <clears throat> so it, it's not that unusual, but um, the thing is, this is uh, that story of Joseph uh, line. So it represents. Do I, do I feel the word coincidence coming up? Yeah. And, and how many times have you had to, to state? Or ask if there is a coincidence within the word of God. Okay, so bro, I, I, yes. you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to let you know that me personally, I, I don't, I don't, I don't foster that sentiment. Well, I understand. But you, in several times in the thread, you have pointed out there are no coincidences in the word of God. So you would know that I don't I don't subscribe to that <laughs> that other thing that you were talking about. 
I know. Now. That's just here. the way I roll, though, bro. Okay. So now, here we are in Joel. The next verse is Joel 1, 1, 1. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree and the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Here we are, are shown that what we have needed in the word of God has been being set aside. If we are choosing to set aside the word of God, if we are choosing to ignore that which he has presented for our benefit, then are we among the wise or are we among the foolish virgins waiting for the wedding feast? The latter. Why are we choosing to be foolish? Throughout all of this, <clears throat> If we are looking, if we are studying according to Miller's rules, <clears throat> we will seek to be willing to help to bring in the harvest. There has been a drought of his word throughout the churches. There has been a drought of his word within the movement. Much of this drought has been because we have become indolent and have allowed men and women such as Parminder and Tess to assume the mantle of leadership. Now, we are being given these warnings. We are given these admonitions so that we may truly wake up. So that we may see the time in which we are currently living. When Christ sees us, ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverances of God's people. Says the revelator, in describing these terrific scourges, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. The sea became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea, and the rivers and the fountains of waters became blood. Revelation 16, 2 to 6, along with verses 8 and 9. As terrible as these inflictions are, God's justice stands fully vindicated. The angel of God declares, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints and of the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Again, Revelation 16, 2 to 6, along with verses 8 and 9. By the condemning the people of God to death, 
they have as truly incurred the guilt of their blood as if it had been shed by their hands. In like manner, Christ declared the Jews of his time guilty of all the blood of the holy men, which had been shed since the days of Abel, for they possessed the same spirit and were seeking to do the same work with those murderers of the prophets. All of this is going to take place after Daniel 12. After Christ has stood up, when he ceases his intercession in the sanctuary. Now is our time. that we may come to understand the word of the Lord. Now is our time to allow the new wine to have its proper place in our lives. In the plague that follows, power is given to the sun to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. The prophets thus describe the condition of the earth at this fearful time. The land mourneth because of the harvest of the field is perished. All of the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. The rivers of waters are dried up and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. The songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place they shall cast them forth with silence. Joel 1, 10 through 12, along with Joel 1, 17 to 20, and Amos 3. We are living in a time when we are to give a message. We are to give this message first where? to the church to the ancient men at the temple well yeah and that's the church and then to where well then the people and then and then to uh, the world all the way through the more that we have been studying in the book of Judges, the more that we have been finding how ill-prepared we have been to be able to give this final message of warning because there has been too much influence upon us of those that were not of God. Do we want to be like the fig tree with many pretentious leaves and bearing no fruit? We need to be prepared to becoming fruitful. Christ is willing to, br to prune so that the sap, the life-giving blood, may flow through all of us. But here today, brothers and sisters, we need to become united in purpose 
forgiving of other, yes please so uh before i forget um so through my interactions with uh am 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 at the uh, ffa uh army banners okay uh one of the things that he brought out that um he was kind of using as a reason not to come to the camp meeting. Okay. Or was, uh, uh, there's nothing on the health message there. So, um, I would like you and everybody else to consider um, what health message that we can include in the camp meeting. I have one idea that I've been working on for the last few days. And it, it really wasn't me. It was just the spirit that was in me at the time. Okay. And so um, I've been sprouting lately, seeds sprouting. Um, and it's, it's a very nutritious thing. And I started noticing some really interesting numbers in some of the things that I was sprouting. Okay. For, for instance, there's a certain amount of seeds, that, I mean, uh, an approximation, certain amount of seeds. And the approximation for a certain amount or for a certain quantity was 144,000. Wow. And, and then that was just one, you know, and I seen some other stuff like 187. I kept seeing these numbers inside of, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering to myself because last night I started preparing as a, um, not, a, I'm kind of methodical about the things that I do. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what plants, uh, the seed groups that I have need to go together in order to make a salad. Okay. You know, that you can sprout. Um, and as I was doing that, it, it dawned on me that, uh, I, I was preparing a, um, a health message. Okay. Um, and so I thought I would just continue on with that, put it in a PowerPoint presentation and use that, uh, as, uh, some, some form of, a health message with a message in that message. Uh, we need to we need to learn how to um, sprout the seeds that we um, basically feed from. So at the, at, there's so many symbolic things in that. I just I I, I couldn't resist uh, sharing that with this well, group. Yeah, well, I sprout uh, seeds because you know, my brother Dave did when I, ever since I was a kid. But um, it's a good way of having fresh stuff in the winter, right? Well, I'm at buying this stuff at and, the and store. they and they store well. They store for a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of like it's you know you got a lot of preppers you know that are prepping and they're putting freeze dried foods and stuff inside of it, but you know they don't offer the same. Um, nutrition that uh, mm -hmm. sprouts do. No, so if you have just seeds and they last a long time, some seeds don't last as long as others. This is true. If you, you refrigerate them, they last quite a while. But I'm saying you can get, I'm talking about when they're dry, you can right. get canned seeds that they're canned. Well, I'm talking about the seeds as well. You uh, Storing in a, uh, a cool thing under a certain temperature, they last a very long time. Yeah, depends on the seeds. Some seeds don't last. True, true. But you can get them canned as well. So yeah, exactly. Um, but and then I, that's how I get my uh, mung seeds. It's like five can, five pound can, yeah. and I sprout that five pound can, you know, over the however long it takes to, for me to consume them, which is kind of a long time. And for five bucks, I mean, you can eat for a long time and have good nutrition. So it kind of mm -hmm. kills two birds with one stone. It's part yeah. of my symbolism. So, so why are they uh, assuming there's nothing about health? Oh, bro, it, it, it's, it's, I have no idea. He just eyeballed the, uh, the um, camp meeting uh, uh, flyer and, and said, there's no health message in there. Blah, blah. Yeah. It was but like a door slamming all of a sudden. But we, we don't even have a schedule or the speakers or anything. Hello, there's nothing on there. I mean, the guy was completely against it from the very first post that he's seen. He just had this whatever spirit that had gotten into him and and went on for, you know, 12 hours and then he ejected me. 
Anyway, but the interaction um, is is indicative of the whole movement. Um, I, 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 my prayer is is that um, that whole group there doesn't end up like FFA itself. Okay, very quickly, because our time is over. I'll give you a thought for your consideration. Have, have most of us heard of a, a food called a broad bean or fava beans? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please consider this. Fava bean is a, a product that is used quite a bit in Middle Eastern cooking, especially in Egyptian cooking. Yeah, that's how I'm familiar with it. Okay. You may find this to be interesting. One cup of prepared cooked fava beans have 187 calories. Okay, you see what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. So I think this uh, a little bit. I, I think when this guy was was angered at me that the spirit kind of was speaking through him, um, and he didn't even know it. He just was denouncing me, and uh, and I got a message out of him. What do you know about that? Okay. <clears throat> uh, if, if that's a complaint, if that's something that people look at, which is valid. Very valid, especially since it's the golden wedge, right? Or the wedge right. that we use. So um, uh, this is just a tactical uh, decision on my part. Um, the uh, to the use of that is is something that can uh, put that uh, wedge in the door. Right. Anyway, so just type in one cup cooked fava beans in Google. But anyway, we got to go. Okay. So shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've spent together. I thank you for all that have participated and for all of the comments and thoughts that have been being presented throughout this study. Direct us now through this Sabbath. Help us that we may honor you in spirit and in truth, that we may keep the Sabbath in our hearts and we come to understand more about how we are to interact with others. Be with us now. Guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.